No. No. Nope. No. 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 Wait a minute. That image looks familiar. It's because it's taken from the International Water Lily Collection website. And that one's taken from Wikipedia. Yes, finally. Oh, right, that's one of mine. As you can see, there's a bit of an identity crisis for Nymphaea cerulea. This video is a visual taxonomic key to identify the plant used in ancient Egyptian rituals as determined in 1883 by Swinefirth, the one named by Savigny in 1803, and described in detail by Kennard in 1905. I started writing this script thinking that I could give you a broad overview of phylogeny and how cerulea violates many of the rules. However, if I explain that as well as I want, that's going to end up being a 10-part series or something. For now, let's just focus on what makes a cerulea a cerulea. I'll point out the morphological features that distinguish cerulea from the masses of lily cultivars and the similar looking but the not so related water plants. Just remember that I am skipping a lot of details in favor of brevity. Stay tuned to the end for even more caveats and go here if you just want a condensed pictorial list of features. So obviously we are talking about a water plant. Cerulea spend their entire lives almost completely submerged in water, though they can survive for several weeks in dry but still humid conditions seen during a drought. That already narrows our list of potential species down quite a bit. Plants that produce flowers are angiosperms, and indeed cerulea does. Very pretty flowers, in my opinion. Seriously, you'd think I gave birth to this plant with the number of pictures I've shared of it on social media. Water lilies are grown primarily for their flowers, though some cultivars have extensive variegation if you're into that sort of thing. And of course, there are the medicinal aspects. The first images you see on vendors' websites are usually of the flower to identify a cultivar quickly. However, Cerulea's flowers are not particularly spectacular, at least to the people unfamiliar with its history. Plant breeders usually look for intense color, numerous petals, and prolific flowering, among other features. Cerulea has none of these qualities. That's at least part of the reason why they haven't received as much horticultural attention as other more vibrant species. A single cerulea plant can produce up to three flowers per week, in my experience, during the peak growing season, depending on conditions and fertility. Though one to two flowers per week is probably more common, the flowers are not very large, only 7 to 15 centimeters across, fully expanded, with 14 to 20 petals and 50 to 75 stamens. These features make cerulea a relatively unattractive prospect for medicinal extract vendors. I believe this is why the much more prolific flower-producing species like Capensis, with its 20 to 30 dark blue petals and 150 to 275 stamens, are often substituted for cerulea. Hence the huge list of misidentified water lilies shown at the start of this video, all of which feature completely blue petals. Because more blue equals more narcotic, right? Right? Cerulea's petals are white, with a tinge of yellow-green at the base, fading to pale blue, sometimes light purple, at the tips. The colors will appear more saturated when dried, but they never become blue at the base. The petals maintain their blue color upon rehydration, which is what allowed Swinefirth to identify cerulea from petals more than 3,000 years old. Drying cut flowers of cerulea in the sun will reduce the petals to a not-so-attractive tan yellow. There are many, many blue-flowered cultivars that I could find with substantially darker and more vibrant blues. These cultivars are derived from the base blue species Capensis, Nuchali, Colorata, Gigantia, Macrantha, and of course, Cerulea. The blue-purple Macrantha is particularly important because it can reproduce vegetatively from bulbils, a highly desirable quality for plant breeding. When flowers are not available, the leaf structure can be used to mostly identify a Cerulea, or at the very least rule out some potential species. The leaves are solid green on the top, and green with dark flecks on the underside. The leaf margin of cerulea is entire, or smooth, though the edges closest to the wedge can have an irregular wavy appearance. Dentate or crenate, toothed leaves, are common in nymphaea and are a sign of something other than cerulea. This is one of the quickest ways to disqualify a potential plant. 
Cerulea's leaves are sort of mid-range in size for Nymphaea, with an upper limit of 30 to 40 centimeters. The smallest lily, Thermarum, produces leaves that are only 2 to 3 centimeters wide at maturity. And the largest Nymphaea leaves belong to Gigantia up to 75 centimeters across. Though obviously as seedlings, the leaves will be much smaller. 2 to 3 millimeters long for the first true leaf on Cerulea. But even during the mature flowering period, leaves can vary in size according to soil fertility and growing space. Likewise, there are also a number of purple flowers that can appear more blue, depending on the age and maturity of the plant, the available light, the fertility of the growing media, and of course, the subtle shifting of the wavelength response of the red cones of your host's eyes. The color of a single flower can bleach in the sun, appearing more purple on the first day of opening and getting progressively lighter blue in the second and third days. That's why it is important to examine a potential cerulea over a long time period. A single photo is not necessarily enough to identify a water lily definitively, though sometimes a single photo is enough to disqualify a potential identification. Furthermore, if a single plant seems to vary considerably during the growing season, that might be evidence of heterogeneity, more specifically, hybridization. Uneven phenotypic expression is more likely to arise due to the different genes of the parent species, especially in self-compatible water lilies like Cerulea, where sexual reproduction tends towards uniformity, not divergence. There are even some chimeric water lily cultivars out there, but that's a different story altogether. The sepals of Cerulea are also quite interesting. They are streaked with dark purple to black lines and specks. As I touched on in my Nelumbo nucifera germination video, there's a lot of crosstalk between lilies and lotuses. This is driven not by morphological similarity, but by confusing nomenclature in the amateur and professional communities alike. Most water garden stores sell these two genera, and they are often confused despite being radically different genetically. However, they are easily distinguished by leaf structure. Nelumbo have whole leaves with special hydrophobic structures on their upper leaf surface that repel water. Nelumbo can produce emergent leaves that rise well above the water surface, but they also produce floating leaves early in the growth cycle, so that isn't a 100% guaranteed identifier. Nymphaea have split leaves that look a bit like Pac-Man that mostly float on the water surface. Large notch leaves are also common in new far species like Spatterdock, but their flowers are very different, so they are unlikely to be confused with Nymphaea. So, in summary, you want this, not this. This, not this. These leaves, not these leaves. These dried flowers, not these dried flowers. This fading color, not this saturated color. This many petals, not this many petals. This color, not this color. This leaf margin, not this leaf margin. These sepals, not these sepals. These petals, not these petals. These stamens, not these stamens. The features listed so far are usually sufficient to properly identify a Nymphaea cerulea, but because I like to torture you, dear viewer, with a deluge of facts, here is an exhaustive list. A botanical identification guide isn't complete without a long paragraph of highly specific anatomical terms, after all. This is taken directly from Cunard 1905, pages 141 to 146. Note that many of these features are shared by other water lilies, especially in the Brachycerus subgenus. Only Nymphaea cerulea will have all of these features, however. Flowers, 7 to 17 centimeters across, light blue, with a faint and characteristic sweet odor. Open three days from 7.30 a.m. to 12, bud distinctly conical with straight sides. Obtuse, abruptly contracted below the receptacle, 7 centimeters long by 2.5 centimeters in diameter at base. Receptacle, nearly three times as wide as peduncle, spreading out at about 45 degrees from the vertical pale purplish green. Peduncle terete, 0.6 to 0.8 centimeters in diameter, 18 to 38 centimeters long, mostly slender, about 1.25 centimeters below flower, smooth, dull, brownish green, 
Main air canal, six, surrounded by a circle of 12 smaller ones. Sepals, four. Broadly lanceolate. Breadth to length, one to 2.8 to 4.7. The sides nearly straight, in upper two-thirds, somewhat converging below the broad base, apex rounded. Outer surface, dark green, thickly flecked with purplish-black dots and lines, most dense near margins of sepal and midway of length. The green ground color assumes a yellowish tint near base of sepal. Seven longitudinal veins can be seen by looking through the sepal at the light. Inner surface, dull white, tinged blue on midline near apex, greenish and veiny, and semi-translucent in lowest three quarters of length. Petals 12 to 20, of moderately firm texture, opening about 30 degrees above horizontal, about as long as sepals. They stand in three series. First, a whorl of four, alternate with the sepals. Second, a whorl of eight, one on each side of each outer petal. Third, a whorl of eight, alternate with the second, but usually imperfect, consisting of only two to five petals on one side of the flower, rendering it so far unsymmetrical. Outermost petal, narrowly elliptic lanceolate, obtuse with rather broad insertion, not at all concave. Outer surface colored on lower half and on the midline, dark green with black spots exactly like the sepals. One third of width at margin on each side, above, colored pale blue. Inner surface white on lower half, becoming translucent and seven-veined at base, shading above to a pale sky blue at apex and on upper margins. Petals of second whorl shorter than those of the first, rhombic, lanceolate, narrowed at apex and base, five-veined below, white on the lower third, pale blue above, pure sky blue at apex, the blue and white shading together insensibly the latter predominating in two-thirds of length on inner surface of petal. Stamens, 50 to 73, sometimes appearing inserted without order, sometimes indistinctly spiral, often in about 16 vertical ranks of three to five stamens each. Outermost stamens with short and rather broad filaments and long acuminate anther with two long, nearly parallel anther cells and proportionately long, acute, three-angled appendage. One angle pointed inward, blue at tip and halfway down, yellowish white below. Median stamen has short, broadly elliptic filament, very long parallel anther cells, and short appendage. Anther and filament bright yellow, only the appendage blue. Innermost stamen bright yellow all over. Short, stout, anther broader and longer than filament, no appendage. Ovary nearly hemispherical. Carpels 14 to 21. Styles short, 0.3 cm long by 0.8 cm in diameter. Fleshy, nearly erect. Subacute, concave inward, all alike, pure yellow, papillos, up to about 0.08 cm from apex. The papillos area ending roundly. Stigma, nearly flat, bending upward on the styles yellow. Axile process rising abruptly from the stigma, broader than high. Height to breadth, 1 to 1.5, and somewhat conical in shape, with obtuse tip of a whitish color. Fruit, large, round, 4.5 to 6.4 centimeters in diameter, by 2.5 to 3.8 centimeters high. Truncate above, with deep radiating fissures between the carpels, flattened or even excavated beneath around the peduncle, of a pale green color, becoming translucent and brownish, crowned with a hard, slightly enlarged styles and surrounded by the sepals and outer four petals, all of which are dark green and spotted as in the flower. The peduncle makes a large, rude spiral turn, holding the fruit still erect but with its base nearly or quite resting on the earth. Seed, ellipsoidal, acuminate at the hilum, 0.17 cm long by 0.12 cm in diameter. Dull olive brown, surface marked with about 14 interrupted longitudinal lines, of minute hairs, raff evident, not prominent, arrow longer than the seed. Is anyone still watching? Leaf of mature plant very narrowly peltate, ovate orbicular to orbicular, 30 to 40 centimeters in diameter, soft, thin, and quickly withering, slightly wavy or sinuate in the basal half, apex slightly emarginate, dark green and obscurely veiny above, Color darker over insertion of petiole. Under surface, paler green. 
with numerous small dark purple blotches which are larger near the midrib than at the periphery. Margins purplish, shading from dark red purple at the extreme edge to green. The transition taking place in the course of about 1 cm near sinus angles in about 2.5 cm at apex of leaf. Veins prominent out to the 5th grade. Primary nerve 6 to 10 on each side of the leaf. Petiole attached by quite a strong collar. Length of principal area, radius of leaf 1 to 1.3 to 1.7. Sinus usually closed. Depth to length of leaf 1 to 2.7. Margins doubly curved, convex, and overlapping above, separating about 2.5 cm from periphery of leaf and becoming parallel. Angles subacute. Slightly produced, about 0.6 cm apart. Petiole terete, or flattened near the leaf, about 0.6 cm in diameter. Dull brownish green, with two larger upper air canals and two smaller ones below, and a ring of 12 still smaller ones outside. Phew! There you have it. A constellation of characteristics that define Nymphaea cerulea. Now on to the reasons why you shouldn't trust anything I have said. First and foremost, no one seems to agree on the phylogeny of cerulea. Some taxonomists call cerulea a variety of Nuchali, not as a species unto itself. In that case, the plants belonging to the Nuchali designation could have white, pink, or blue flowers. The leaves can have dentate margins with a dark purple underside. If you can't tell by the description given in this video, I don't subscribe to that hypothesis. Primarily because the blue flowered Nuchali has 2n equals 56 chromosomes and Cerulea has 2n equals 28. Not that this is absolute evidence of antonomy. Plants are more tolerant of chromosomal differences than animals. Anyway, because Nymphaea readily hybridize and have been doing so for millions of years, strict taxonomy based upon sterility of offspring just doesn't work. So we are stuck with the old morphology-based classification, which I have presented in this video. Similarly, the traits presented here might be overly specific. I only have a single specimen of what I believe to be Nymphaea cerulea. All of the images used in this video are of my specimen alone. I am reasonably sure, based on the literature, that these traits are not overly specific. But again, this is all rather fluid. Just know that this is an active area of research, with more reliable molecular evidence coming out all the time. Secondly, there are a few features that I did not talk about in this video, but which are defined in the literature. I'm not about to dig up my only plant to show you cross-sections of the rhizome, for example. Likewise, when I can afford a decent microscope, I'll have some microscopic morphology and maybe some cytology to further confirm this identification. But I still might find something on my plant that contradicts the literature, ruling out Cerulea as an ID. Finally, the question of medicinal value of Cerulea in relation to other species. I have no idea what kind of Nymphaea has the highest concentration of active principles. I suspect the ancient Egyptians didn't either. They found some local plants that had some medicinal properties. Later, they drew some pictures on walls and occasionally buried their dead with a couple of petals. The most potent Nymphaea might very well be something that the ancient Egyptians didn't have access to. Indeed, the all-white species Nymphaea ampla is depicted in Mayan art in a medicinal or spiritual context in the same way that Cerulea was shown in Egyptian art. In fact, I have reason to believe that the original association of Cerulea with ancient Egyptian rituals by Swinefirth in 1883 was incorrect, or at least what we now call Cerulea. For whatever reason, Cerulea entered the public consciousness as the one and only psychoactive species, with its blue color used as the primary marketing tool for vendors ever since, even when they aren't actually selling Cerulea. This video is about identifying a species not what that species will do for you if you eat it. So if you have any questions related to the morphology or disagree with me about it, please don't hesitate to comment. A request before I go. Please don't put links to specific products in the comments asking, is this a real blue lily? The point of this video is to teach you how to identify Cerulea yourself. 
I hope this video was enlightening. Thanks for sticking around. On the other hand, Thof of the Nymphaea Cerulea have their edges carefully finuated. Their lobes are more pointed and commonly divergent. The inferior furfus exhibits ribs carefully fenfable, the principal ones of which only are somewhat prominent, the reft being concave and lefts elevated than the disc. The petioles of thief leaves are exceedingly rough.